Welcome to In Conversation. The next 30 minutes, we'll be speaking with Manal Al-Sharif. And as you've noticed, Brett Solomon, Executive Director of Access Now, is also going to join us for the conversation. As usual, ask your questions. Post them in the chat box. We'll try to get to as many as possible. We really love your questions. Now, Manal is a computer scientist and a cybersecurity specialist and activist. She led the hashtag Women to Drive campaign uh, in 2011, uh, trying to push Saudi Arabia to allow women to drive. Uh, she is a founder of the Women to Hack Academy, a program that aims to foster tech talent in Saudi Arabia with a focus on information security. She is now using her expertise in cybersecurity to begin a new project called the Ethical Technologist Society to bring together experts to help advocate for more transparency. Welcome to In Conversation, Manal. Hi, Melissa. Hi, Brett. Good Hi. to be here. So let's just start. Virtually. <laughs> yes. So let's just start with you um, talking a little bit about your work. Uh, so my work in activism or my work in cybersecurity? <laughs> Bit of both. Yeah, they I mean, they overlap, intersect. I would say. Yeah. But pretty much, yes. So uh, I work in cybersecurity and it's a male-dominated industry. And working in Saudi Arabia, where most of the internet is censored heavily by the government, I learned how to bypass. I didn't know that was called hacking. That was in 99. And I think that opened the, the world for me to learn that even blocked places, even censored uh, spaces, whether virtually or like physically, there are ways to bypass them. And I think my career was my training grounds for being an activist. So I joined the Arab Spring Movement in 2011 by starting the Women to Drive movement, actually on Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter. And now I'm completely off all these social media uh, because things completely changed ten years later. Yeah, that's so f so fascinating. Actually, I was I wanted to ask you about that. How you know many of the platforms were your your allies, uh, and now I don't know how you would describe them. Maybe not your enemies, but you know there's a significant um, cost that you've experienced personally, and I think maybe also for the movement that would be very interesting to hear, like how how that changed for you, how your relationship with social media changed, and perhaps also like what you see forecasting to the future in terms of social media for activism? Good question. So, you know, the Arab, the Arab youth, we use social media to ignite revolution and topple dictators. And at that time, they didn't use algorithm to rate your post. Mm. So people would join those social media platforms because they believed in those causes, they wanted to um, <clears throat> follow it, they wanted to support it. And it was very organic reach. Like I remember when I opened my Twitter account after I was released from jail for driving while female, yeah. I had 10,000 followers at that night, in yeah. just one night. And when I posted the video of me driving in the city of Al Khubar, I had around 700,000 views in just one day. I didn't pay ads. Uh, I didn't ask influencers to push my videos. It was pretty much organic because we didn't have algorithm at that time right. that chooses what you see on your feet. Uh, fast forward, Twitter, uh, they had a mule by this, uh, uh, an intern, uh, a Saudi intern yeah. that, that became a, a, a mule to Saudi Arabia who leaked our numbers. My number was leaked actually because I linked my Twitter account to my Australian number. And I have a call from the national security on my Australian number. And I'm like, how did they get my number? And then we found out that mule leaked around 6,000 numbers uh, of Twitter users. Most of them are anonymous, been tweeting and, and criticizing the government and the conservative uh, uh, religious establishment in Saudi Arabia. Some of them are still in jail until today. So people who ran these, uh, Twitter accounts, uh, they, found, uh, they found out who they are through their phone numbers yeah. because Twitter didn't have a due diligence of having uh, not having a flat network with an intern, have access to all their Twitter users. And uh, when the FBI went to Twitter, they went and they told, they told the, the mule that, hey, FBI are after you. He would, in, the, 
he was in the next flight to Saudi Arabia and, and Twitter should be really sued for what mm. happened. Um, I'll mention one name, Abdurrahman Al-Sadhan. If you will go to freesadhan.org, yeah. uh, Abdurrahman Al-Sadhan used to run a social, um, a Twitter account and he's in jail today. He's sentenced for 20 years in jail and 20 years ban mm. and because of his Twitter account. So yeah. yes, I closed my all my social media accounts because now it's been used the same tools we used for our liberation and find our voice is being used to oppress us. Yeah, I mean, I think many of us have, have documented that shift um, in the way that these tools have worked so actively. I mean, we even was called, you know, the, the Twitter Arab Spring, um, that, it, you know, people, and wrongly or rightly, there was definitely a sense of, of liberation. Really interesting that you talk about staff uh, within, within some of the tech companies as well, this idea that there was you know, the Saudi Arabian government had planted a staff member to be able to gain access to all of this information, including your phone number and your own identity, and people are in prison as a result. I'm also interested in the kind of gender elements around this. You know, you're obviously such a legend, <laughs> I want to say, in terms Thank of... You. No, I mean, you know, what, you've, what you and your community have done... Um, um, in terms of bringing women's rights to the fore, both within Saudi but also in the region and, and internationally. Um, how do you think that the kind of, both in the positive sense but now also perhaps in that negative sense, how social media and technology is impacting women and particularly feminists who are advocating for political and social change? Unfortunately, first of all, Britt, you're a star too. I <laughs> love access now work like your work is very important for human rights around the world and people like me to come and and, and um thank you i really admire the work you're doing um it's a I great team i'll say but thank you, you, I'll, you I'll, I'll convey that <laughs> please you're go an on. inspiration um social media used effectively to spread a lot of misinformation and in Saudi Arabia, it doesn't matter how well-educated you are. It doesn't matter uh, um, how well-traveled and uh, how well you think you are well-informed. Social media being used to um, propagate or, or to... Uh, the government is using it for their propaganda in an unprecedented way. I don't think governments today, dictatorships and authoritarian regime found a tool better than social media to spread their propaganda <clears throat> and, and hyper-target people and show you a reality completely different than a diff the other person reality. <clears throat> and also use it for surveillance, collecting all this amount of data about us. Um, so social media also being used for harassment. A lot of activists being, um, I, I received death threats, rape threats, uh, so much harassment. Uh, not only the rumors, <clears throat> it's used effectively for character assassination and, and terrorizing people when they speak up, when they go online and speak up. And then even the people around you who you grow up with and they know you, your family, your close friends, they start questioning you when they go and read all this amount of lies. Um, you know, the, the, the Nazis, the Nazis propaganda is like a lie told a million times becomes reality becomes the truth. And that's what social media does. And unfortunately, because of the engagement algorithm that pushes what causes fear and anger. So all these, the, these are the posts and now are the ones that are rewarded. Mm. So and I don't, it really affected human rights and it really affected get the, getting the truth out. And also the avalanche of information that we get it overwhelms people mm -hmm. so that you don't, you don't even have time anymore. Uh, to respond. To validate. Yeah, to yeah. validate. Yeah. yeah. And it is interesting, uh, Melissa, the way in which, you know, we've talked a lot this week about disinformation, about the way in which content is propagated mm -hmm. with, via the algorithm on technology platforms. Um, and, you know, this is an instance, obviously, that's happening in Saudi, but we're seeing replicated all over the world. And, and so how unfortunate is it that, activist response like Manal's is like, I'm out of here, you know, I'm out of here instead of, uh, you know, I, I, I can't emotionally 
or otherwise respond to the content that's come, the false content that's coming I mean, through. Tech companies essentially have been co-opted by so many authoritarian states, and it looks like they're winning. Yeah. The other side is winning, um, and that there has been a, a failure in terms of accountability in a lot of these yeah. tech companies. And the odd thing is as well, and I sort of want to look at you behind and here and there, and um, Manal, because you're in a big screen behind us, but um, there you are. Uh, but just to say that, you know, in many countries, also, like, the tech platforms are actually the buffer mm -hmm. between the citizen and the state. And so you're in this sort of conflicting position where, like, you know, in Myanmar, activists in Ethiopia, Sudan, I mean, you name a country, activists are desperate to be able to get to a neutral platform to be able to convey to the rest of the world what's going on. And, but if it's, if, it's, if it's unsafe, if it's politically unsafe, I mean, we know that there are instances, as you say, of individuals who are still detained as a result of that leakage. You also mentioned the issue of surveillance. I think it's not just about, you know, sort of content and false information. It's also about tracking. Right. Um, and you'd be good to, you know, we and we, the other thing that we know is that the Saudi government is not just tracking citizens inside Saudi, but actually across borders as well. So it'd be good for you to talk a little bit about that about the sort of surveillance regime that you've seen within Saudi and its activities um, across um, into different jurisdictions. And how successful um, have mm. the Saudis been with their surveillance outside their borders? That's an interesting one. Mm. Yeah, one of the activists, or the woman uh, to drive uh, movement activist who was jailed. I was lucky because I live in Australia. Um, I escaped jail. <laughs> she, when she left jail, the, she sent me a message on WhatsApp and she said, oh my God, I couldn't believe she was out of jail and I was just checking with her if she's okay. And I said, hey, don't use WhatsApp. Can you talk to me on Signal or Telegram or Wicker or any of the activists that we use? And I'm a cybersecurity expert. Like this is, I teach activists how to stay secure online. Mm -hmm. And she said, no, no, no. And this was 2017, 2018, maybe, right. yeah. when she left jail. And she said, no, 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 they can see everything as if they are shoulder surfing, as they are next to you, mm. looking at your screen. And I'm like, how? There is encryption. What do you mean? Uh, if it's encrypted, they can intercept encrypted messages. She said, no, no, no. They use tools that we don't know what, but they, they showed me messages that we use encrypted channels to send. And I couldn't believe it. Mm. And then when Citizen Lab came out, with yep. NSO group, the Pegasus. Yeah. And it's funny because I have all the, you know, the two-factor authentication on my phone where it yeah. has to send me a message. And I was paying attention that my account's been sending me a message from a number in Turkey. So my two-way authenticator, they hacked even my two-way authenticator. And I had to, I always change my phone because um, I know that I've been targeted by Pegasus. And I keep changing, like, I, 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 I keep changing my phone because Pegasus, in cybersecurity, we always teach people, don't click on links from unknown sources. Right. With Pegasus, it doesn't you work. Don't even need they have to. the zero yeah. day, the zero click exploit. Right. I've never heard this in my life. And I've been working in cybersecurity since 2002. I'm a computer scientist too. Like I studied five years, computer science. So when the activists were telling me, I was still thinking this is like uh, sci-fi. This is not yeah. true. Uh, guys, I work in cybersecurity. You're undermining my experience in this <laughs> field. But apparently, we are actually dealing with unprecedented uh, enemy, which is the, the private hacking tools mm. that being built by some of the top. Uh, the Israelis are known to be some of the top when it comes to cybersecurity because they, they, they exist in a an area of geopolitical unrest. So they, that's their survival mechanism yeah. is to be to learn the offensive. Uh, yeah. But when they started selling that, because Saudi Arabia don't have the cap capacity to create such tools, but now they have the money to go and that's buy right. these tools. Uh, and this is actually, and maybe Melissa, you have a follow-up question mm. as well, but I just want to touch on this point about the surveillance trade. I think it's essential that the RightsCon community understands the commerce that's attached to this, the money that's behind this. And it's why we, as an organisation, together with many others like Amnesty International and Human Rights Watch, 
uh, have called for a moratorium on the sale of um, spyware, the trade in spyware, because there's a number of things that can happen here. We can put export licenses in place, sanctions in place, um, regulatory environments, companies, essentially, uh, companies are selling and governments are buying. Uh, and it's, uh, you know, this, this call for a moratorium, it also came through the High Commissioner um, in her statement, um, which was released this week, absolutely essential that we both shine a light on this trade and that we also put an end to it. I think a lot of people forget, um, perhaps not this particular community, but um, you know, most or a lot, the majority uh, of the sales of surveillance is still coming um, from the United States and Europe. Mm. Uh, China really wants to get in on the market uh, as well, and it's focusing a lot on the Global South by undercutting in terms of price, uh, what it can offer in, in terms of uh, surveillance hardware and software. Uh, but still, uh, some of the biggest producers of surveillance software is- Coming out of the democracies. Is, are coming out of democracies. It was democracies. good to see the US government did put um, the NSO group, which produces Pegasus, on its entity list. Um, blacklisted it on its entity list, which was excellent. And I think we've seen the Costa Rican government also now call for a moratorium. It's the first government that's called for it. So I think we're at a tipping point. We need this RightsCon community to really talk to our governments and the companies that are listening that this, this is actually a trade in weapons. And I think we need to understand it as such. Um, I'm also interested in uh, the kind of the role of like the cloud centers and the location of data centers within Saudi. You know, there's been a recent move by a number of organizations to um, get a resolution at the AGM at Google to say that there really needs to be proper human rights due diligence uh, on the location of data centers um, and this suggestion that there will be a data center um, located in, in Saudi Arabia. Can you reflect upon that for a second? Um. It's interesting because I want my country to be prosperous and I want them to have the advancement of technology and enjoy that. Of course, I want this to my country. Um, my problem is not with have, building a data center in Saudi Arabia. Mm -hmm. uh, my problem is with um, Saudi Arabia can buy it from Google, can buy it from China, can buy it from any, anyone else. So it doesn't really matter who they buy there. There is always, even when you, uh, let's say, any so group, there's a, a big backlash against them. There are other hundred any so group yeah. under the table, quietly selling their technology. I think we do need a universal declaration of digital rights that annexed to the universal declaration of human rights. And all the UN members sign that so whatever technology that uh, Saudi Arabia or whatever uh, authoritarian regimes end up using, mm. when there are abuses, uh, at least the people who've been, this technology being used against them, they're aware. There's a way for them to, to, to tell. Because unfortunately, the US, you talk about NSO group, they bought the NSO group. They use NSO group against yeah. its own citizens. Yeah. So even like it's, it's, it's a they very so, difficult yeah. situation where we live today. Mm. Uh, democracies abusing their citizens' trust, uh, dictatorships too. Most tech companies, the Northern Star is profit. As long as our Northern Star is our profit, profit will always be over people. It doesn't matter human rights uh, violations uh, that happens because of the technology that we create, as long as our Northern Star. And I think those shareholders, if they're brave enough, shareholders should really yeah. say that our success is not only the profit that we make in the next quarter, but actually is, uh, as you mentioned, human rights, due diligence, uh, social corporate responsibility, uh, 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 environmental, all these should be part of what major success. We can live in a world where the, the profit drives all our decisions. And I think that that is what hurting human rights. That was hurting the planet. That's what's hurting those companies themselves. Because yeah. when are we going to learn? It's what, we're not going to live in, in this world for long if we still continue doing business as usual, the way we do. 
Actually, um, we're going to get into a QA and a uh, section soon, mm. but um, I'm wondering before we do that, Manal, if I can take a step back and ask you where things stand in Saudi Arabia. Uh, you said earlier that you want your country to be prosperous. Um, do people there, are they happy? Um, do you get a sense of to what extent they have access to free information? To what extent do you feel like there's enough dissent and people are unsatisfied? And all of this, of course, is so hard to gauge because of the social media uh, problem. But uh, get, tell us a little bit about that. Unfortunately, social media being used effectively to change the discourse in Saudi Arabia and to push the agenda of the, the government. Uh, there is um, the brainwashing I've been seeing now for highly educated people who I thought they have critical thinking is something I've never experienced in my life, which is very interesting. There's so much distraction happening by opening cinemas and, and allowing mm -hmm. music festivals for the first time in Saudi Arabia and Dakar or whatever. And it's really just that bling that distracts people from the bigger issue, which is human rights, civil rights, political rights that they don't have. There are hundreds of thousands in jails today. No one talks about them. There is a shutdown of any dissent, uh, whether online or in, in real life. There is this intimidation that happens. It's very, very clearly happened uh, through. So you don't find really voices. The voice has been shut down inside Arabia. Uh, it's a sad reality. Mm -hmm. I do want my country to be prosperous. I do want to be to have sanctions against the country. But at the same time, uh, people, uh, there's a way to go for people to demand their civil rights and political rights and be part of their decision making instead of just still being treated like children mm. in Saudi Arabia. That decisions been taken uh, in our absence and we have to follow. And it's a highly educated country. Like 99% of the internet penetration, 99% the internet penetration in Saudi Arabia. Mm. Uh, uh, around 99% is the literacy. Uh, people are highly educated. They go to colleges. Mostly they study in the US, but they go back to Saudi Arabia. And when you live in that echo chamber, Saudi Arabia use OSPEX. If anyone heard of OSPEX, OSPEX is a behavioral communication company. All the people who left Cambridge Analytica mm. were hired by OSPEX. OSPEX mm. is being uh, is owned by the Emiratis actually uh, through a proxy, Egyptian proxy that works for the Emirati government, and they use behavioral communication to change how people think about their governments. Yeah. So people, when I talk to them back home, they're happy. They think I'm the ungrateful yeah. one. Uh, because I live abroad, and I'm like, wow. Yeah. So it's we funny, have yeah. Middle Eastern Cambridge Analytica, which is OSPEX, by the way. Uh, yeah, I mean, I just, uh, what you're saying it strikes such a chord, because I think there's a tendency to think of authoritarianism and equate it with a country that is very poor, like North Korea or something. And what we're really seeing is that a lot of countries can be prosperous and authoritarian, can be highly educated and authoritarian. And high tech. And high tech. You know, like China. We were discussing before this yeah. idea that, like, you know, the Saudis trying to move away from oil, trying to move into high tech, and therefore tech had traditionally been thought of as, like, tech, openness, freedom of expression, free flow of data, etc. But this idea about being high tech and suppressive at the same time, which I think the Chinese are kind of, you know, at the forefront of, it's a, it's a shift in the way... We're in the midst of a shift in the way that we have to understand... Um, you know, and as you coming back to your first point, which is like tech is actually the pathway to suppression. Mm, mm. Um, yeah. We, but uh, yeah. can I say one thing of about course, tech? please. And then tech I want to ask you about making... encryption. There's a question or two yeah. from the audience, but please. Tech makes oppression soft. <clears throat> it's yeah. the soft oppression. Mm. It's tech makes the illusion of freedom uh, mm. so real. And that what scares me about technology. Yeah. Um, there's a couple of questions from the audience. One relates to encryption. Could you give us a sense of, like, what your message to leaders, uh, the tech companies and within governments um, is with respect to the importance of encryption? You kind of touched on it before, um, but it would be good uh, to expand because, you know, this is the, the encryption wars that we're still in. <laughs> yep. um, it doesn't seem to go away. So, like, it would be great to hear what your key message is. 
Uh, my key message is China been harvesting a lot of data in the last few years. They've been investing a lot in quantum computing. Quantum computing will actually decrypt the existing yeah. encryption. So good luck with encryption. Yeah, we have talked in some of the sessions here throughout the week about the relationship between quantum and encryption. And, you know, and it's close. It's very close, it's quantum computing. Yeah. We yeah. thought it's going to be 50 years until we have quantum computing that unlock the existing mm. encryption. Mm. That's not true. It's and, happening very soon. Yeah, and one of the things about quantum, I think, is obviously we want quantum encryption, but we don't want quantum com computing power the to be able to decrypt past right. things that are encrypted. It will. To, it, will. it will. That's And so how do we... Um, how do we prepare for that? You know, if encryption, uh, if quantum is, you know, five or ten years away, or whatever the actual, you know, the, the, the year is, and there's been some recent announcements actually indicating, you know, indicating that we um, will um, be facing, you know, the application of, of, of quantum computing, you know, presently. Um, how do we prepare for that? Like, how do we get ready for, um, how do we re-encrypt or how do we delete? It you will hear something shocking from me that you want to hear from computer scientists okay. or a technologist. You it here right I, now. Think, <laughs> I think there are things had to be have to be done in the old-fashioned way, where it doesn't have to be online. <laughs> it has yeah. to be offline. And I think right. once you go online, that's it. Game over. Anyone with the time and money will have access to your data. Right. I think that's the next phase. I mean, it's that, just that's like. I mean, that's what I do as a journalist. If I really want to be yes. secure, I meet somebody in person or I write a old, an old-fashioned letter. Um, uh, Manal, I want to get to this question. Please, um, yeah. it's, it's probably a good note to end on. Uh, the question is, what can feminists from outside of Saudi Arabia help or how can they help improve women's rights in the country? So how, how can the women of the world unite and work on this issue? Uh, I think my dream is we don't have feminists. We don't point mm. out women. That's my dream. But that's maybe my, my grandchildren will live this dream. How we can help is just to be self-aware. Uh, that's the first thing. I think all of us, we need to be self-aware, men and women. And we need to learn to know our fears. Being self-aware and knowing our fears is very important. Because sometimes our fears are the ones that stops in the way of speaking up, of when we see injustice, or when we want to demand uh, our rights, when we want to create a long-standing status quo. And I live in Australia, and and I see the women even here struggle when they reach positions of power. And I'm like, wow, this is interesting. You have all the rules and policies that support women in power, but you don't find women in power because the culture didn't change. And, mm. and women can't speak up or do want to speak up because they're so scared of being pointed, like singled out as troublemakers. Um, I think feminists, not calling it feminist, just being a woman or being a human, it's just being self-aware, learning how to speak up. And learning that the struggle for women's rights anywhere in the world contributes to women's rights around the world. Mm. I think that is very important to know the collective yeah, I was Struggle. actually going to say, like, I would also like to flip the question as well, which is, like, whether you, you know, like the term feminist or not or see the need. But, like, there's this idea about, like, what can the women, uh, the feminists of Saudi Arabia also teach feminists around mm. the world as well. I think it's hopefully a kind of collective, multi-directional conversation because, you know, I mean, I, in preparation for this discussion, I had a look at, you know, your, some of the videos that you posted in 2011, I, I watched your TED talk and I could see a lot of women in the audience just like, you know, just in awe of what you and your community had managed to, what the feminists had managed to do, what the women drivers had managed to do, not just to the issue of driving, but also how does that impact the society as a whole? And I think that, you know, Roe v. Wade and developments that are happening, it's a right. constant battle whether it be on you know reproductive rights or LGBT rights, etc., like we got to have we have to continuously learn from each other. And you know you've been in a very constrained environment. You're now in Australia. Um, there's so much that we can learn from you, and I think we've already learned from you. And I don't know. I, I would like to. We will definitely continue this conversation uh, at future rights cons because 
um, it's so important to the future of our society and the enjoyment of human rights on and offline. Manal Al-Sharif, thank you so much for joining us in the studio. We're so grateful for your time, and this was a fantastic conversation. Thank you. And, and guys, listen to my podcast, Tech Number 4 Evil, techforevil.com. It's about technology and human rights. You got it. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you.